Greetings, good morning, wherever it is that you are tuned in to this program from. My name is Mucha and I'm really delighted to bring you to this conversation this morning. In complex times, we know that leaders need different strategies and tactics to be able to drive sustainable performance. When we are facing new business pressures, we can't use yesterday's leadership and management approaches and expect to actually get positive results. We need an approach in these VUCA times of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, approaches that are suited to this context. Hosted by PTS Africa, the EQ at Work Executive Thought Series is a monthly conversation with executives from across the African continent, delving into their insights about leadership in these trying times, the future of work, and how leaders can pivot to ensure that they remain relevant as they lead their teams forward. The EQ at Work Executive Thought Series provides a learning platform for leaders and aspiring leaders who want to get practical insights on emotional intelligence at work and learn how it can be more important than IQ for leadership success, gain an understanding on how the leaders themselves have leveraged emotional intelligence in their own personal leadership journey and receive tools to build the emotional muscle necessary to lead in these uncertain and unpredictable times so that they can drive sustainable performance. I'm delighted to be hosting a special edition of our EQ at Work Executive Thought Series. And I want us to jump right in and invite my guest for today uh, to the show. Today is special because uh, my guest is Leroy Munetzi, the COO Consulting at Alexander Forbes. And it's special because since we launched this series, uh, Leroy has been facilitating the conversations with executives across Africa. And today, Leroy is in the hot seat. Leroy, welcome to this conversation today. It's great to have you. Awesome. Uh, lovely to be here too, and uh, scary to be on the other side of the table. <laughs> I'm sure it is, and I'm sure the leaders that you've had conversations with uh, would love to hear your take uh, on some of the questions that you have asked them. So really happy to be here with you today. As the CEO consulting at Alexander Forbes, Leroy is responsible for enabling and supporting all the client-facing business units within uh, the group to deliver on uh, their mandate. Lira is passionate about solving problems, optimizing performance, and leading people. He has a background in finance with a diverse understanding of business and leadership, gained through his experience across a variety of industries and geographies. If you'd like to connect with Leroy beyond uh, this conversation, you can connect with him on LinkedIn and we are going to share his um, LinkedIn profile. Thank you so much, uh, like I said, for joining us today. Really delighted to have this conversation uh, with you. Lira, I want us to uh, jump right in because one hour is not very long and I know it will fly by. So let's jump right into this conversation. And I wanna start as you always do, by asking you to just tell us a bit about yourself and your uh, growing up and um, yeah, just give us some background so that we may know who this uh, Leroy truly is. Thanks, Mucha. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was actually going to suggest that you do that for me since you've known me <laughs> so long. I, I, I have the fortunate privilege of... Uh, being your cousin and uh, therefore uh, for my sins, I have to do things as you say, but nonetheless, I'm, 
I'm the firstborn son of uh, a pastor, uh, unfortunately late now, Elijah Munetzi, and my mom was a teacher, uh, the firstborn of six uh, altogether. My dad was a extrovert, uh, very much a people's person. My mom is an introvert, the calm, collected uh, heartbeat of the family. Uh, and in my role as the elder sibling, I think I've, uh, I've had to get involved in contributing to the leadership of the family from an early age. And that's probably where I was able to build off uh, some of the things that I now use in my day-to-day -day role uh, came from my family uh, background. But I grew up mainly in Zim. We had the opportunity to travel quite a bit with my dad. Uh, in his role as a pastor and also uh, being an eager beaver who wanted to study quite a bit. Uh, we got to live in the States while he was doing some postgrad studies and then also in the Philippines uh, again when he was doing more postgrad studies. Uh, so we did get the opportunity to travel, meet different people uh, and form great relationships, some which I still have to this day. If I then look at it from a career point of view, I studied accounting, uh, had a great and very inspirational accounting teacher in high school, Mrs. Tarr, uh, bless her soul, she uh, made accounting easy for me. Uh, even though assessments that I've done later in life have shown that I probably became the perfect blend of my mom and dad because I'm borderline introvert, extrovert, uh, I, I also have a strong left brain, right brain balance. So accounting I can do, but naturally I'm also more creative and playful uh, and I enjoy the colorful things in life. So I studied accounting because I found it doable, but uh, when I was younger, I probably would have aspired to be a graphic designer or something a lot more creative. Nonetheless, I uh, then started my career in the financial management side of things and have progressively gone through the journey that I've uh, gone through so far. That's me in a you've nutshell. Gone, yeah, you've, you've, you've gone very quickly through um, and given us, um, you know, some, some key insights. Um, perhaps, you know, as Leroy mentioned, um, being family, we have known each other as long as we have known each other. We won't go into the detail of the number of years. Um, but I was um, thinking back on some of the reflections that I have um, of Leroy uh, growing up and some of the memories I have. And I was telling Leroy that one of the memories that sticks out in my mind is a day when uh, we were at their place and, um, you know, messing around as young people do. And we have a very dear friend of ours, um, the late Chance uh, Senzani. And uh, Chance and Leroy, in essence, dared me to drive. Uh, I think it must have been Leroy's car. And I say dared me. They didn't dare me exactly. I mean, they just asked me if I could drive. But they should have known, knowing me as they both do, that uh, that question of can I drive would lead me to declare obviously that I could. And, um, yeah, suffice to say, uh, it did not end uh, very well. So I have some very many uh, fond memories of uh, growing up. And I can see some comments here saying uh, that they doubt the element of being an introvert, right? Um, I can see some, some comments coming through that this introvert story is, is a new one. Uh, and we're not quite sure if it is uh, the way that we, who know you very well, uh, would describe you. But thank you so much for sharing a little about your upbringing. And um, I, I, I will continue to share some of my insights. Um, do you remember what you wanted to be when you grew up? When you were 13, 14, uh, do you have clear memories of what you wanted to be? Was it an accountant? It definitely wasn't to be an accountant. Uh, maybe a little before 13, 14, probably more around 9, 10, 11. I specifically wanted to be an American police officer. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess it had to do with uh, Magnum PI and some of the uh, TV shows we watched at the time, but also growing up in Zim amazingly, and I, I still can't fathom the logic, uh, policemen in Zimbabwe wore shorts. Yeah, that's, that's just unbelievable. And so when you compare a policeman who wears shorts with one who's all kitted up in blue, 
uh, somehow, I guess that inspired me to want to be an American uh, police officer. But yeah, a little bit later on, I think my aspirations were more on the creative side, like I mentioned a few moments ago. I actually really wanted to be a graphic designer. Uh, and uh, in high school, I was uh, the school cartoonist. Uh, some people who were with me remember the Aloigi report that a good friend of mine, Trevino Naidu, and I put together every so often and we'd take pot shots at the teachers and make fun of couples and certain people. We did get beaten up for some of the stuff that we wrote, but yeah, I, I was a lot more on the colorful and creative side back then. Um, thank you, thank you very much for sharing me. And, and I'm smiling because yes, I remember some of those colorful creative uh, moments and some of the mischief that we got up to um, when we were younger. Um, thank you for joining us. I can see we have a lot uh, of individuals who've joined us. Thank you for your comments. Keep sharing your comments and share any questions that you may have for Leroy a little later. I will come to asking your questions, but yeah, please keep sharing your comments. Uh, Leroy, a lot of people are saying, no way, introvert, no chance. Um, that's the, 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 the trending comment at the moment is, yeah, that one is a story that you are telling. Uh, big shout out to all the family members who are tuned in. We see you. We appreciate you. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. But yeah, the running commentary right now is introvert, no chance. Um, so yes, um, just um, continuing and thinking about your um, upbringing. And, you know, in this conversation, we really have been looking at our leaders and, and really tracking back to their growing up and, you know, asking questions around, you know, what shaped them to be the leaders um, that they are. So can you share one of your earliest experiences with leadership as a young man? I know you spoke very briefly about um, the fact that as the first born in a family of six, you know, you, you took on a leadership role uh, as, as part of the family. But um, could you share in a bit more detail, whether it is family related or in any other of the spheres of your life, your earliest experiences with leadership? It, it does definitely start back in the home. And uh, uh, unfortunately, because some of my brothers and probably my sister are, uh, are, are watching this, I will remind them that I got the opportunity to change most of their nappies when they were younger, especially <laughs> the last one. Uh, probably just Lyndon, I was too young. Uh, but I think in the home environment, I absolutely, like most um, black families, if I could put it that way, or African families where the children do play an active part uh, in part of being part of the leadership at home or doing chores and running errands and that kind of stuff. So I think from a very early age, I knew I, I had certain responsibilities, whether it was around setting the table and uh, helping it uh, with gardening and that kind of stuff. And because of my position as the firstborn son, uh, I would do a lot of the coordinating with the sibling. So a lot of um, my early memories probably start at home and then to a large extent move into the church environment where dad played a, a very prominent role and we moved around quite a bit, but we got involved in helping to prepare lessons for Sabbath school or uh, different youth activities as we grew a little bit older. Um, I did get to uh, play out one of my big passions is music. Uh, and I became a music uh, leader at some point uh, throughout my early days. And I worked with many people who uh, I still have as friends till this day, we worked together. And in some cases I was uh, fortunate to lead uh, with some of those uh, music groups that we had. but. Probably from a more formal point of view, I also had the opportunity to be a prefect in high school. Um, I was a prefect in Form 3 as well as in Form 4, um, which, which was kind of special because I got to do it in Form 3 and in Form 4. Uh, it saved me from uh, being bullied by certain big boys uh, in Form 3, but at the same time, I got to be a bit of a bully in Form 4. But uh, no doubt there is responsibility that comes with that in supporting teachers or supporting uh, to maintain peace and discipline in certain cases. And those are some of the early highlights that spring to mind.
for me in terms of my leadership journey. Absolutely a lot in the home, a little bit in the church environment, and definitely in school, uh, high school, um, to be specific. So, you know, there's this conversation about, you know, nature, nurture, right? And just thinking about your um, upbringing and, as you've mentioned, home, uh, church, and, and school, um, you know, what do you think contributed or what was the biggest contribution to uh, who you are as a leader? Is it um, nature? Is it nurture? Or would you say it's a combination of both? I would say it's definitely a combination. Um, there are certain attributes that I realize um, my parents had. So my dad, in his role, in his personality, was a leader in the church. He was someone who was a leader in the community. My mom, coincidentally, is also a firstborn child. And because of that, she had certain leadership traits that she exhibited in the home as well as in our extended family. Um, and to this day, I think there are certain things that I've been able to say I've inherited from both of them or from the combination of uh, being both. In fact, I like to say I'm the purest version of both of them. The rest are rejects that came after me. <laughs> for another day. <laughs> so I think there is a little bit of nature in, uh, in the fact that I inherited certain traits, which I absolutely can draw back to my dad and to my mom. But also in the nurture side of things, there are lots of lessons that I in hindsight, I can pick from things that they said to me as my parents and things that I drew from other role players in the uh, extended family structure, in the church environment, and in my early careers, which helped to nurture the leader that I've become. So from my dad, absolutely a lot more of the personality uh, I, I, I drew from him um, and the, the power of the network. I think my dad was a great networker. Um, he, he was a linguist par excellence. He, he, he knew many different languages. He could preach in several languages. Um, and I think aspiring to be like him in many ways has helped me to build off that and play on the networking dynamic of, uh, of, of leadership. Uh, from my mom, I think uh, some of the things that she's helped to nurture in me uh, have to do with reliability. Uh, she, as well as some of my aunts, have always, um, I don't know if it was deliberate, but over the years, they've always called me a dutiful son. Uh, and they've, you know, tried to drive that in. And I think from an early age, it helped to raise my awareness of the need to be reliable, to be dependable, and to be trustworthy. And I think some of those things, which now that I look at it as a, as a more mature young man, I can see that there was some nurturing uh, that contributed to, to who I've become and how I approach life. Mm. Uh, I must say that you know, your, aunt, your mom remains one of my favorite aunts. Um, I love the rich conversations that we are able to have uh, with her and um, her, her outlook on life, I think. And I can see that that is something that runs through for you. And when I think back, um, growing up and I think of your, your dad, you know, some of the memories I have is us sitting at the back of church and getting up to all sorts of mischief and him being on the pulpit and somehow being able to look at us with that eye that would cause us to sit up properly and, and, and pay attention uh, to his sermon. And he had an, a, a way of connecting with people, which, as you said, you know, really uh, contributed to his ability to build amazing networks. And I believe this is something that you definitely have uh, gotten from him. Thank you so much for all the comments that I can see uh, here. Uh, Leroy, apparently you are an extroverted introvert. I think that is the conclusion uh, that people have come to. Uh, uh, Sabelo is here with us and he's talking about some experience uh, that he had, something about being thrown out of a car uh, one day. Uh, I think that's a story for another day. And I, your siblings are here. And yes, they've heard that comment about uh, rejects. And um, yes, apparently uh, they shall deal with you later. So thank you so much to everyone who is tuned into this conversation. Please continue to share your comments, your insights. Um, you know, there's a comment here I see that says, uh, Leroy, I didn't know you lived in countries outside Africa. 
your immersion in various countries explains a lot about your phenomenal character. This illustrates how exposure shapes one's worldview. You're one of the most balanced people I know. Um, I thought that was an interesting comment and you know, it's a little off script, but what are your thoughts when you look at that? How much has your, uh, you know, moving around shaped uh, the person that you are? I, I would definitely agree and thank you for, for the comment. Uh, I, I appreciate the kind words. I think it's, it's definitely something that contributed to my ability to engage with people from all walks of life. Uh, my dad uh, definitely was comfortable at all levels in terms of he could he could engage with very important people as well as the common man. Um, and I think my exposure to him doing what he was doing and my exposure through us living in different places um, and in different communities and having to make friends uh, in those different places absolutely has helped to shape my ability to engage with people now in different communities and at different levels uh, and from different walks of life. Uh, living in the Philippines as a highlight um, between the ages of 10 and 12, uh, you know, it's early adolescent days. You, 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 you're trying to figure out who you are uh, as, a, as a young person. And I think in that community that we lived in, it was a very multinational community. So I had friends from Sri Lanka, from Indonesia. I had uh, friends from other parts of the African continent, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, the Mwamakambas, you know, some of them are still friends to this day. Uh, and a lot of those uh, friendships that we were forced to kind of generate or engage at an early stage, I think helped to deal with the diversity of language dynamics, personality dynamics, um, physical attributes, as well as some of the historical uh, dynamics that you find in racial differences. So there were dynamics that I can point to where, for instance, in the Philippines, they were not very familiar with uh, black people. And our hair was something that they found curious. My sister, uh, had beautiful long hair and my mom you would always do it up and it would have stuff in it and people would want to play with her hair and as the big brother in some cases I remember having to uh, you know stop people from doing that but no doubt all of those different experiences further on in life have definitely influenced how I engage with people one of my current passions now which I'm fortunate to be able to play out in my current role is diversity uh, and uh, I, I head up our diversity and inclusion forum, and uh, it gives me the opportunity to engage, talk to people from different perspectives, and help to influence and shape how, as an organization at Alexander Forbes specifically, we contribute to the diversity and inclusion agenda, which is very, very important and critical here in South Africa, and I think globally, uh, to put it uh, out there. Yeah, I think it's um it's it's very true. I, I I believe that being exposed at a young age to different cultures, you know, really has an impact and it moves you from being the kind of individual who's very blinkered. Um if we take some time to reflect on your professional career, which has been phenomenal, um, is there a moment in your journey which you believe was pivotal in setting you on the path? that you have ended up taking? Is it a who or is it a what? And, you know, especially given the fact that in your uh, early um, youth, in your teenage years, you know, after you got over wanting to be an American policeman, you wanted to move into the creative space. So, you know, what was the pivotal moment that led you uh, down the path that you have taken? I would say I had a few uh, pivotal moments where a few people, again, uh, played very interesting roles in setting me up for who I have become. Uh, I was very fortunate to have many people who made time for me from a very early uh, stage in my life. So back in high school into university, I had mentors or people who just really supported me. Uh, Uncle Jay or uh, Justice Dube, a.k.a. Fat Man, uh, he really gave me a lot of guidance and support. 
Uh, at some point, I was his driver, but you know, at the same time, he was my accounts lecturer. Uh, you know, and we have a relationship that we've grown to this day, uh, and I sometimes still tap into him. But him and other people along the way, for me, I think cumulatively became the pivot in that what they taught me was the importance of earning trust as mm -hmm. well as building trust. So if I look at the role that um, the Tigeres, as an example, play uh, in giving me my first job um, uh, at, at, at the tender age of 20. Uh, and coincidentally, uh, just about a month from now, I'll be celebrating 25 years since I graduated and a week after that, 25 years since I started working. So it's amazing to think of how the years have flown by. But um, people like the Tigeres uh, were very instrumental in giving me an opportunity. And when I look back at it, they, they trusted me. Um, fast forward a couple of years, I worked for a lady named Louise Cole uh, at Cadbury's. She trusted me. Um, I then worked for a guy named uh, Alfie Naidu and Nick Young at ABSA several years later. And I still pick up that they trusted me. And I think the trust element in there um, is something that I found to be pivotal as soon as I started to realize the importance of earning trust and building trust. Because what we don't realize sometimes is the amount of empowerment that comes from knowing that you're trusted is, is phenomenal. Um, there's a quote, and I can't remember the specific words, so I'll, I'll, I'll tweak it here, but it goes something like, people do the most for people they want to disappoint the least. So to the extent that you absolutely do not want to disappoint your parents, you will do the most. To the point that you absolutely do not want to Support your favorite boss. Um, you will, the early leaders that I worked with um, and the early relationships that I had, I think, have proven to be quite pivotal in then transitioning who I've become as a leader. And, and it all really, in many ways, hinges on leadership trusting uh, me uh, and empowering me to explore and really become who I could be, the best version of who I could be. I love that. And, you know, I, I look back and remember those days of your first job and uh, first apartment. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, we were truly living the life as um, young 20-year-olds. Um, what have you done for those behind you? You know, you talk a lot about this idea of um, supporting the people who, you know, really lifted you up and provided support to you as, <clears throat> excuse me, as you are growing and, and growing in leadership. Have you done the same? Have you been paying it forward? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's something that I, I actively try and do. Uh, when, when people with uh, less experience or people who are going through different challenges reach out to me, I deliberately try and make the time. Uh, I think for me, making that time is, as you say, paying it forward because it definitely contributed in many ways to who I am. And right now, even with some of the leaders that I work with, I encourage them to be accessible and available because it's invaluable, the amount of support that you can give someone because it's not always going to come from a textbook. It's not always going to come from a YouTube video. Uh, it comes from having a conversation with someone who can simply share either how they would tackle a situation or what they've gone through. And I think in the theme of emotional intelligence, which, which is our primary focus, um, and I, 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 I like the way uh, Simon Sinek is trying to change our, our script there and call it uh, human intelligence or something uh, along those lines. But it is really about showing others that these things are happening to all of us. 
and it's relatable in many ways. And so in paying it forward or making time for others, I, I like to share that I'm not perfect. I'm not the superstar that you might think I am. I'm just a guy who's trying to be dad of the year for the rest of my life uh, and trying to, uh, you know, make a success of uh, being the big brother to, you know, five other siblings uh, and contribute to, you know, making things better to the extent that I can uh, and leaving a positive legacy. But absolutely, the power of sharing your time and sh sharing your insights is very important. And maybe as a last point to, to, to wrap this particular segment off is, I think sometimes people continue to look upward and I'll use age as the spectrum here. So pe younger people like to look up to older people for insights and for uh, wisdom, so to speak. But I, I would like to highlight that I've actually gained a lot from speaking to younger people and sharing uh, with younger people and having conversations with younger people because apart from learning someone else's journey, which is completely agnostic of age, you also learn different perspectives. And being open-minded, I think, is another key facet of uh, emotional intelligence. Uh, being open to different stories, different opinions, different perspectives comes from people across the spectrum. And it's not an up and down thing from an age point of view or rank point of view. It really is just someone else's uh, ingredients that have come together that we can all learn from each other. And that's, for me, a big uh, takeout from relationshiping and networking and mentoring and coaching. I think you're on mute. I was saying that um, it's great to have all the comments that are coming through. I see our family members are, are here and uh, sparking lots of uh, conversation in the comments. Uh, Chico, <clears throat> excuse me. Chico, it's great to have you online. Chico says that Lira is a natural leader and definitely the nurturing he got from church and family and exposure to many cultures helped shape his uh, leadership skills. Um, thank you for your comments, Chico. Uh, Flora says, agreed 100%. Innocent agrees with that comment as well. And uh, we have a user who says it's fitting that you are the chairperson of the diversity forum, as you mentioned, uh, for your organization. And, um, you know, there are comments here that, you know, your siblings are great leaders in themselves uh, because of your great uh, leadership. So, um, <clears throat> yes. And so in, in, in light of that, there is a pushback that they are not rejects, huh? since they have followed in your footsteps and they are great leaders in their own right. Um, thank you so much for um, sharing your insights on, on leadership. And, you know, one of the things that I say over and over, and I will not get tired of saying, is that emotional intelligence isn't another skill that leaders need to add to the already heaving plate that um, they are, you know, contending with. Rather, emotional intelligence is the plate itself upon which all other uh, leadership skills resides. If you want to get better at communicating with your team, you need greater emotional intelligence. If you want to get better at um, delegating to your team, you need greater emotional intelligence. If you want to build trust, which is one of those things you've said is integral for leadership, you need to develop a uh, greater emotional intelligence. So for me, emotional intelligence really is the glue uh, that helps leaders to be the best versions of themselves. It's interesting to me the comment you made about, you know, encouraging other leaders that you uh, work with to be more accessible. When you consider in our early working days how the leader was in this corner office that was only accessible by um, appointment, this has shifted, would you not agree, and shifted uh, for those who want to be successful as leaders? Absolutely. I definitely think um, more modern leadership styles talk to being accessible. And I think the trend moving away from uh, the trend to move away from uh, offices, as an example, is something that has contributed to that. So, yes, in the past uh, and in the older days, 
that there was the executive suite and in the executive suite, you know, people were hardly accessible and you find more, uh, you know, hip and modern and fresh uh, urban uh, companies have definitely moved away from that. And I think that accessibility talks to even just how you show up. The, the, the demeanor that you have as a leader is just as important. Um, I like to say, for instance, uh, one of the things that I've encouraged leaders that I've worked with and people that I've worked with is greet people. Simple thing, just greet people. In the elevator, on the stairs, at the coffee shop, greet someone. And it's an African thing to simply acknowledge the other human being by saying good morning, bonjour, uh, sawa, how's it? Uh, whatever it might be, you connect at that level, you show that you're also human. The fact that you may have a certain title or certain responsibilities is besides the point. At the root of it all, you're also a human being who had breakfast or is having breakfast or needs breakfast, uh, whatever the situation might be. And I think that's uh, it's so much, it's, it's a big opportunity for leaders to be accessible and connect with their people because it then leads into some of that trust building that I referred to earlier, as well as really empowering people to have the confidence because I think sometimes that confidence dynamic needs either just a little nudge, just a extra teaspoon of support uh, to give people the courage to then become more and to try and become more or ultimately achieve more. Mm. I love that comment about greeting people. Um, there are very many organizations we work with, and one of the things I always tell um, the leaders of those organizations is a great way to get an idea of the temperature within the organization is to just visit incognito and go into the elevator and see how people interact with each other because there are times where you're in an elevator and no one says anything to anyone, and yet these are people working for the same organization. So I agree. Um, you know, just how we connect with people is so important. Uh, Sandy here says, I appreciate your trust in me and mentorship. Your leadership with empathy and humanity is inspiring. Thank you for paying it forward. Uh, there are so many who've said, you know, you are always available uh, to impart wisdom. Um, and, you know, people are really appreciating how you pay it forward and uh, share with others. I'm looking at the time and it's amazing how, Time flies by when you're having fun. Um, Leroy, no one is perfect, as you've already said, and you've probably made some mistakes along the way. What are you, are you comfortable sharing one of these with us and the lessons that you learned uh, from that particular mistake? And as Leroy shares this, guys, please do share any questions that you may have uh, for Leroy and his um, leadership journey. So any mistakes, mistakes that you've made that you're happy to share with us and the lessons you've learned? I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to share, but uh, <laughs> there's, there's, there's a, a, a wide range of uh, lessons that I've learned from shortcomings or slip-ups uh, that I've made along the way. One of the earliest ones um, in my career as a bean counter, um, I... I still needed to learn the, the need to be disciplined with my time and to make sure that I am reliable and I get stuff done. Uh, and in the business that I worked for at the time, Elida Automotive with the, with the Tigeres, um, I missed the cutoff to put through certain accounting provisions. Uh, and the consequences of that, of course, was it distorted our financial results for the month and ultimately distorted our cash flow projections. And for a small, medium sized organization, it had significant repercussions on our ability to deliver our business. Um, and I, you know, to, 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 for, there, there's, there's, there's no better way to put it, but I felt like cuck. I felt like shit. It, it, it was a huge thing that I could have simply avoided by being better organized. Uh, and fortunately, I learned that lesson very early on in, in, in my career. And it helped me to realize that in that dynamic of being trusted, and in this case, again, uh, my, my, my leadership team trusted me with this big responsibility and I slipped up. Uh, and the consequences of that slip up 
were fairly material uh, for the organization. But the lesson for me is, you know, even in my current role, uh, to the extent that there are certain tasks or commitments uh, that I've made, I must deliver on those commitments and be reliable because the consequences uh, can be far reaching. And that's why it's so important. A, a good friend of mine uh, named Colin Mulepe, um, one of the guys who in many ways I call the ultimate COO, um, he likes to say things go wrong uh, when people don't do their job because organizations are designed, processes are designed, uh, procedures and policies are designed to make sure things go a certain way. And things generally only go wrong when someone deviates from that process or deviates from the design. And therefore, one, one of the key realizations for me from that uh, early lesson is do what you are supposed to do, be reliable, be dependable, um, and that helps things to work better. And maybe a second one, if I quickly um, fast forward to a key lesson a lot later on in my career, it has to do with um, the network and, and people and building off again the dynamic of diversity. It's not necessarily a mistake, but I think it's a realization that I came to in my leadership journey uh, is that not everyone is on your side um, and not everyone is your supporter. Um, but how you deal with that is very critical because to the extent that not everyone is your cheerleader and is trying to push you forward, it may impact you in a way that on the one side could depress you, it could pull you down. Uh, on the other side, it could distract you and you end up focusing on things that are not really as important, but it's so much more important for you to rise above uh, and in certain cases to try and mend or change that scenario to an extent if you can but in some cases it's just to accept um yeah. and it is how it is um you don't need to be everyone's friend you don't need everyone to be your supporter um we're always going to see things differently and some people will never see things uh the way that you see it and it's okay and i think that has been a big lesson for me having grown up in the church and all of that, at some level, I think I was naive. And I almost thought we could all sing Kumbaya together all the time. But the reality in real life is, it's not quite that, um, mm. but that should not detract you from your purpose. That should not detract you from the opportunities and the role that you may have to play wherever you may be. I really like that comment you've just made, Leroy. And especially because I think for me, it really sums up emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence isn't about thinking that we're all going to sit around in a circle and sing Kumbaya, as you've said. Emotional intelligence is, is far much more than that. And so <clears throat> thank you very much for highlighting that. We have a couple of questions that I'd like to get to. Um, time is really flying by. So we have a question. Oh, and before I go to the questions, let me just give a shout out to Ayanda. Ayanda, thank you so much for joining us. Ayanda was in the hot seat with Leroy uh, just a few months ago. So thank you for uh, being here um, today. I'm sure it's interesting for you to see Leroy uh, being on the other side uh, of the conversation. We have a couple of comments uh, that we have, a couple of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of questions that we have um, that I am going to share. Um, but before I do that, before I do that, let me just uh, catch up with the comments. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, I think that um, this has been a really interactive conversation. I think I get some a comment here from Elsie. Elsie says, I concur, greet people, connect with them, even the security guards and the janitors. Uh, Ayanda says that a title doesn't mean you are a superior human. It simply means that you have a different responsibility. I love that comment, Ayanda. Thank you very much uh, for sharing. Um, and Ayanda also says, um, the Zulus say, not everyone will love you. Uh, you aren't money. <laughs> I love that. Not everyone will love you. You aren't money. Um, so there's a couple of questions here that I want to get to. Uh, one is from Doreen, and Doreen says, how is inclusion and EQ connected in leadership? How is EQ and include? How is inclusion and EQ connected in leadership? Uh, 
Uh, Lira, we seem to have lost you for a second. Can you hear the question? All right, uh, we seem to have uh, lost uh, Leroy. Are you back? Yay! All right. So you see the question? How is inclusion and EQ connected in leadership? Nah, no worries. Inclusion and EQ. I, in my opinion, I think that um, inclusion talks to leveraging the different strengths and the different contributions uh, from different role players. So I like to draw some of my leadership insights from sport. So in sport, sometimes we don't realize the power of teamwork um, and teamwork draws on the fact that we all play different roles towards a common goal. Um, and most team sports like soccer or basketball or volleyball, um, you've got forwards, you've got backs, you've got defenders, you've got attack, you've got, uh, you know, people playing different roles. And I think inclusion talks to ensuring that everyone plays their role and acknowledging that everyone has a role to play. Um, even when you look at uh, individual sports like boxing, I was a big Mike Tyson fan, tennis, I'm a big Roger Federer fan, um, uh, and even Formula One now, and, and we're all hyping up uh, and supporting in Lewis Hamilton, but even in individual sports, there's a team around you. And that talks to, again, inclusion. We celebrate the fact that someone simply goes out to that racetrack to change tires. On that day, they simply change tires. And you need to include them and acknowledge them, give them a sense of belonging because their role contributes to the overall success of Lewis Hamilton, the individual, but Mercedes, the team. And I think that dynamic uh, is key, again, from an EQ point of view in that understanding who you are, being open to other people's perspectives, uh, and self-regulating how you influence and impact others uh, goes a long way to giving people either a sense of belonging or really then just leveraging the strengths that come from that diversity. Yeah. One of the things that I, I, I share along this whole uh, inclusion and diversity line is um, a quotation by Talmud, which says, we see the world not the way it is, but the way we are. And I think it's important for us to understand that as long as you have a brain, you have bias. And that's because the brain is wired to have a preference for patterns and a preference for categorizing the way that we see things and then making assumptions about those categories. And that really is at the root of, of what bias is all about. So the way that we can disrupt this bias is being aware and then leveraging the power of emotional intelligence to tap into those emotions that cause us to, to kind of act from that place of bias and actually disrupt that. And so for me, emotional intelligence is an integral part. I, think, I don't think you can have a fruitful conversation about uh, inclusion, a fruitful conversation about disrupting bias without getting to the root of the emotions that underlie um, the bias that, that we have. Um, we have some more questions and I'm looking at the time. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, uh, time is flying by. Um, there's a question, there was a question, an earlier question. I can't seem to find it now, but I, I saw a question from uh, Michael. Michael Musinguzi says, um, how would you describe your leadership style? So how would you describe your leadership style? That's a question uh, from Michael, and then we'll come back to some more questions. So it's probably hard for me to uh, to narrow it down, but it probably, I would say I'm an open uh, and engaging type of leader. Um, and I guess that, that talks to my personality. One of the things that I benefited from uh, on my journey is the opportunity to be myself. Um, way back about 15 odd years ago, I worked at ABSA for a guy named Alfie Naidu. Uh, he was unap unapologetically himself. I hardly saw him wear a tie and he was you know, on the group exco of the ABSA group. Uh, he was a very senior individual, but back in those days for him, it was skinny jeans, uh, you know, open his buttons down, halfway down his chest. Uh, and he was a skinny Indian dude, but he was unapologetically himself. And I think 
from a leadership style point of view, it's so important that you are who you are uh, because that's how you'll actually thrive and things will come more naturally. And I think for me, my style is to be open. I, I know that I don't have all the answers and therefore I'm always keen and operate. I like to play to uh, the team uh, style. So working with others is, is key for me. And I've found that to help me in, in many ways in the different uh, roles that I've been uh, by being able to leverage the collaborative strength um, that I get from, from the team. So I think from a style point of view, it definitely leans towards being more of the team sport type person uh, than a solo yeah. hero like Superman or Batman. <laughs> Although you are still a little confused, um, and, and I remember this from childhood about which team to support, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that uh, for another day. Um, some more comments here. Um, Chimuka says, courage is a big word and um, act. It comes in short supply for some. And I think, you know, that really speaks to uh, when you think about your last comment about authenticity, about being yourself. Um, it takes courage to be who you really are and show up uh, authentically. Uh, Tuli says, um, I think this is uh, another uh, saying, not everyone will hate you. You are not death, right? So not everyone will love you. You aren't money. Not everyone will hate you. You're not death. And, and I think it really takes emotional intelligence uh, to be able to especially work with those who don't necessarily love you. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for that. I have another question here from David Otieno. Hi, Leroy. Thanks for sharing your experience. I'm just starting off my career. I find it quite difficult working in a space where I'm mostly required to be a comrade, follow direction without question, majorly because I like to analyze situations, have a discussion on the best approach I need to take, and come up with a solution. What would be your advice for me? How does this affect my career growth as a leader? I work in the software ecosystem just to put this in perspective. Thank you so much for your question, David. Uh, Lira, your thoughts on that? So I'll focus on the, and thanks, David. Uh, great question. I'll focus on the dynamic of getting to start having an impact or starting to influence what you do my thoughts would be firstly be patient um it is important to to build the the confidence of the people you work with so absolutely recognize that um you don't want to be a yes man you don't want to be just someone who follows um but be patient and then progressively look to negotiate your way into that decision platform or into the path of impact um, be very deliberate about taking bite-sized chunks into this elephant. Um, it's not something that you're going to be able to switch or turn overnight. And therefore, my first guidance around being patient uh, is, is step one. Number two is find small ways to progressively shift the tide. And a lot of that has to do with building credibility. So in whatever responsibilities, whatever tasks that you have that you are doing, do them well, do them to the point where it seemed to be great, it seemed to be amazing. And those little things uh, and those opportunities of success will build the credibility that progressively will hopefully get you into that path of impact. So I would say all the best, but be patient, build on it, and hopefully get the credibility to get onto the table at some point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from Flora. Uh, Flora says, Leroy, kindly share your perspective on employability and experience. I would say the simple answer for me, based on my experience, is learn, learn, and learn some more. Uh, and I think now there's that dynamic of unlearning certain things and relearning certain things. But it really is about being open to accumulating uh, experience and knowledge uh, and a good friend of mine likes to say it takes you exactly five years to get five years experience. So work <laughs> through the opportunity to learn along the way. It will come with time, but completely understand that there's an opportunity to learn in every situation. It might be technical learning. It might be softer skill learning. It might be just exposure to how not to do certain things. But in that uh, experience that you gain over time, uh, 
uh, it will increase your employability, it will increase your ability to have impact and influence in different situations, but learn, learn, and learn some more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lira. We have a few questions coming in. If you're tuned in with us, uh, please uh, just give us a few more minutes of your time uh, because I would like to get to these other questions that we have before we wrap up. So we may overshoot our time by about five minutes or so. So do uh, stay with us. I have a question from Sami Medirata who says, do you have any advice for employees to be able to encourage leaders to touch base with their EQ discreetly? Some leaders don't seem to be aware of the effects that their behavior has on others. That's a fabulous question. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that is a, a very important question because call, call them leadership blind spots, call them egos, call them different dynamics from a, from a leadership point of view. Again, because we are all different creatures, um, even outside of the professional environment, look in the home environment. There are certain uncles uh, who you know don't want to be caught out or told that they're wrong. And it starts in those in informal setups and it you know, leads into the more formal setups in the professional space. Uh, but I think one of the ways to uh, tackle it is by holding up a mirror. Uh, and as you get older or as you get more experience and you have more courage and more confidence, uh, as best as you can hold up a mirror because sometimes someone doesn't see it because no one is holding up the mirror. Um, there's that story about no one told the emperor that he was naked, um, you know, going around <laughs> singing his song, let's call it that. Uh, and I think it's our role as, as members of the community, members of the team, uh, as best as we can. And I like, you know, Sameh, as you say, uh, from a discreet point of view, is to find the little opportunities to play back someone's impact on you. Um, I like to say sometimes uh, it's important, and I say this to my kids sometimes, tell me if, if I've got spinach in my teeth, because I don't know I have that spinach in my teeth. Uh, and sometimes for that leader, maybe no one has had the courage to hold up, hold up the mirror and to reflect it back to them to say, do you realize that um, this is how you're coming across? Or maybe to put it in a, a specific example, thank you for what you did, but this is how I felt when you, when you did that or when you said that. Uh, and progressively, I think you will gain the trust to be able to say more and con contribute more uh, to that situation. But no doubt, it's, it's not easy uh, and it will never be uh, a simple uh, situation to deal with but try again to do it uh, as in, in small pieces and in small steps. That's probably the best way to do it. Fantastic, thank you. We have um, one more question here from Senele. Uh, what is the one tip you can give leaders in handling difficult conversations, like having to fire somebody? Have you ever fired somebody? Uh, anyway, so that's another question for you. Yes, I've unfortunately had to. Uh, a few years back, we had a, a, a team member who was unfortunately not playing their role in the way that we needed, and it wasn't supporting uh, the overall direction of the organization. And I think for me, uh, dealing with such a difficult conversation, you need to be objective. You need to be um, frank and honest. Uh, the reasons why you are letting go of someone should be clear. It shouldn't be subjective. Um, and you have to take the you have to take the person out of the situation and play the situation rather than play the person, so to speak. And I think being honest and objective means that you can focus on the facts, give the person the reasons why, uh, especially if you've gone through the process and you've given them, them an opportunity, you can play back all of the work that you've done or the things that you've tried to do uh, to remedy the situation. But by the time you then have to pull the trigger, it's more likely to be objective. And I'd say then it's about focusing on the facts, be as objective as you can, and then to a, to a great extent, be direct. Um, don't pull the Band-Aid off slowly to an extent, uh, especially when you've built up the, uh, the storyline in an objective way, do it as quickly as possible and then move forward. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so Hope that much helps for that. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, it helped me as well, especially that point about not pulling off the band-aid slowly. 
Uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing that. I think um, we have actually answered all the questions I can see anyway uh, that have come through. There are so many comments that have come through. Um, Kosana says, Leroy, never disappointing for in delivering and leading. Thank you for sharing. Uh, David is appreciating the uh, response that you gave to the question that he asked. Uh, Flora says, thank you so much, Leroy, for your great inspiring uh, um, speech and for this successful event. Uh, Kezia, fantastic conversation. Thank you for the insight, uh, Leroy. Um, lots of feedback from those who are uh, tuned in. Tuli says, Uncle Leroy, it's Nadal, not Federer. At least you got the right football team, uh, although I beg to differ on that, Tuli. I'm not sure that he does have uh, the right football team. One last question before we come to kind of wrapping up and parting shots. I'm just scrolling through the comments. I don't want to leave anyone uh, feeling as though we didn't attend to theirs. Michael says, Leroy, how has failure or apparent failure set you up for later success? So you talked earlier about some of the mistakes you've made, but just really uh, drawing from those insights, how did that set you up going forward? So I'd say there's, there's always value in experience. There's always value in the good things and the bad things that you experience because what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, they say. So I think in my experience, some of the shortcomings or the slip ups of the past or the realizations that I've gone through over my journey have contributed to who I am today. And I think sometimes as not just as leaders, but as individuals, we forget the value and the opportunity that comes in reflection, taking the time to play things back, taking the time to remember some of the things you've experienced because all of those can contribute to who you are and how you approach things today. I like to say I'm very fortunate to be in a role right now where I'm able to be myself and I'm also able to consolidate a lot of the experience that I've gained over the 25 odd years that I've been working. Um, but to be the best at what I do now, I do need to take the time at the end of the day to reflect on the day, at the end of the week or end of the month, or at some point during the year, to look back even further at some of those lessons and re-in-play uh, uh, some of those things or reinstitute some of those learnings uh, to a large extent, because I think that's what helps you to then fail faster when, when certain situations uh, present themselves, but also really to navigate the challenges that uh, may present themselves down the line. So yeah, probably that in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Thank you, Franklin, it's great to see you online. Uh, shout out to uh, Lyndon. I know I saw you earlier as well. Uh, Faye, I'm not sure if you're on, but um, if you were, shout out to you as well. Um, Floyd, I've not seen you, but if you are, shout out to you as well. So big shout out to all of uh, Leroy's siblings, uh, my dear cousins who have been on this and sharing comments. Uh, please don't beat him up too bad for calling you rejects. Um, I'm sure he was just playing to the camera. Uh, but thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in and for this a delightful conversation. Lira, as we bring our conversation to a close, as we, as we bring our conversation to the close, our continent is known to be full of untapped potential. What role do you believe emotional intelligence can play in helping leaders to unlock some of this potential? I would say that our African opportunity talks to us being proud of who we are. Uh, I said at an individual level, for instance, it's important to be yourself and leverage uh, your own strengths, play to your strengths and, and, and don't be apologetic about it. And I think as a continent, one of our biggest opportunities is to just be African. Uh, African solutions for African challenges, uh, not being afraid to uh, live out Ubuntu, as we say down here in South Africa or Chivanu in Shona, uh, but just that natural togetherness uh, that will hopefully take us to Uhuru. Somehow we need to realize that the stuff that might seem sexy, might seem fancy, which is a lot more Western oriented, uh, has its place. But there's also a very big place and a big opportunity for us from an African perspective. And I think from a leadership point of view, we need to acknowledge, recognize and support that. So whether it's about greeting, it's also about thanking, it's also about acknowledging uh, and supporting because a child is not raised 
by an individual it's raised by the community or the village i think is the same and i think that's a dynamic that uh, we don't play enough to and if you look at a lot of different african proverbs um they do talk to togetherness if you want to go fast go along but if you want to go far you know go together uh and i think that africanism is a big opportunity that leaders should be able to pick up on and you will be surprised to find how much eq is actually embedded in africanism I, I i love that last point you just said because you know many may look at emotional intelligence or so, as something that is very western but I, I i think you know to your point that not it may be that we didn't call it emotional intelligence uh, but at its core, emotional intelligence is about very many of our Africanisms. And I love that African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, uh, go together. I think it really summarizes, for me, what is at the core of emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is about being more aware, being more intentional, and being more purposeful. And I think those are uh, principles that are rooted in who we are as Africans. And I love what you've just said that we should you know be proud of who we are and play uh to our strengths as a parting shot and you know thank you so much to everyone who has tuned in and thank you for your comments i can really see that we have enjoyed uh the conversation uh we need to focus on our ubuntu uh david says our umoja uh here in kenya as a parting shot you know maybe slightly off from what we've been talking about what are you reading right now I'm reading a book called Time to Think. Uh, I got it from a good friend of mine a few years ago, uh, and it really talks to the power of creating an environment where people can become more of who they are, which, which, which is something I've touched on already, but creating an environment where people are allowed to think and ultimately to succeed. So it's Time to Think by a lady called Nancy Klein. Uh, but yeah, we can post we can post it in the uh, in the chat a little bit later. That's that's my is current that, reading. Is awesome. Is that Klein with a K or a C? K L I N E. Fantastic. So there you have it. Our book recommendation from our leader today, our executive on today's EQ at work executive thoughts is time to think by uh, Nancy Klein. Leroy, thank you so much. This has been such a fun conversation. I hope that I have filled your shoes adequately as I have stepped in as the moderator for this month's edition of the EQ at Work Executive Thoughts. This is a platform where we really demystify leadership and talk about how emotional intelligence actually can be more important than IQ for you in your leadership journey. Any final thoughts that you would like to share before we sign off, Leroy? I'd say thank you for the opportunity. It's been great. And yes, you've done a fantastic job as a host. Uh, you should actually do it more often, I think. Uh, but to everyone who's tuned in, thank you. And great comments. Uh, the rejects or defects, uh, catch me if you can. Uh, but uh, I think to everyone else, uh, be there, be be yourselves, uh, and I wish you all the best in your careers, on your journeys, play to your strengths, build trust, and uh, yeah, hopefully we can always find a way to connect on things like LinkedIn, and I look forward to uh, celebrating the successes of all of us uh, as a continent somewhere down the line. Thank you very much, Leroy. And um, you, know, you will remain our hostess, our host with the most, or hostess with the mostess. Uh, you will remain our almost Richard Quest um, as you continue this conversation with leaders across Africa. If this is your first time joining us, this is a conversation we have every month, uh, typically the first, the second Tuesday of every month. And Leroy has conversations with executives across uh, Africa. And, you know, it's a great conversation that he normally has and great insights for you in your leadership journey. So diarize uh, this, the second Tuesday. I know today is Wednesday, but it's typically the second Tuesday of every month. And you can follow us online and connect with us so that you keep uh, abreast of who the different leaders uh, we have. We've had phenomenal leaders who have shared their insights and, you know, Leroy has joined them today by sharing his uh, great insights. So what is it that I have learned today? 
from Leroy. Thank you so much, Leroy, for all the amazing insights you've shared. Uh, one of the key things that I have learned today is that, you know, you must earn and build trust. And I think this really is at the core of emotional intelligence because you can only build trust by connecting with people. Trust is actually an emotion if you consider it. And so you build that trust in the way that you connect with people, in the way that you show up. And as Lira has said repeatedly, in your being authentic, being your authentic self, I think this is extremely important. Uh, the second insight or the second takeaway for me is pay it forward by sharing your time, your wisdom, and your skills. Um, Leroy is someone who really does give of himself. The fact that he's here with us today, the fact that he hosts our event on a monthly basis is just evidence. And very, very many of you shared in the comments how he has, you know, impacted you in his uh, way of, um, you know, giving back. So that's another lesson. And the third is accumulate experiences and knowledge. There is an opportunity to learn in every situation. So be patient, be willing to, uh, you know, build that experience. And as you're building the experience, as time is passing, don't just be marking time, invest in yourself. As Lira said it best, it takes five years to gain five years worth of experience. So there you have it from us, the PTS Africa team. We are so delighted that you've shared this time with us. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. And um, Franklin says he'll see you in five so that he can deal with some of the comments <laughs> that you have made uh, openly here. Um, Franklin, be kind, you know, don't, don't be, don't be too hard on him. Thank you so much, guys. Um, I, I can Thank continue you, this conversation. <laughs> and it looks like Lyndon is coming along too. Uh, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. And honestly, I could go on for another uh, 30 minutes, but let's allow people to get back to work. Thank you so much for your time and for your contribution uh, today. Thank you. It's been great. There you have it. We've been listening to Leroy Munetsi, the COO consulting at Alexander Forbes, as he shares, as he shared his leadership experience and his leadership journey. Let me just say it one more time. Emotional intelligence isn't another skill that you need to add to your plate. Emotional intelligence is the plate upon which all leadership skills reside. And if you want to thrive as a leader, if you want to bring out the best in your people, invest in building your emotional intelligence competence. On that note, allow me to invite you to join our 40-week EQ challenge. We are en route. It has been ongoing, but please do join us. Go to our website, www.pts.co.ke, and you will find a link to join our 40-week EQ challenge, which is really a journey of transformation where on a weekly basis, we are practicing emotional intelligence together. So join, sign up and join us. We are almost, I think, next week at week 10. So it's not too late to join us. I am delighted to have hosted this conversation and really to support you in your leadership journey as you develop this crucial competence of emotional intelligence. Connect with us online at PTS Africa across all uh, social media channels. And you can also collect, connect with me directly at Mucha Mulingo. Delighted to have been your host this morning. Thank you to all of you who tuned in. And it's been really fantastic to see friends and family who've been part of this conversation. Thank you and have a fabulous rest of your day.